Good morning. morning. I'm the Reverend Rachel Hayes, minister of the Unitarian Universalist Society of Amherst. I use she, her pronouns. Welcome to you, old friends and new, young and old, in the Zoom and in the sanctuary, whether today is your first or your thousandth Sunday in our midst, we are stronger because you are with us. You are an essential part of our celebration today. We are one people of many beliefs, many origins, sexualities, and genders. We are all growing, all learning, all loved. Just as you are, you are welcome here. Today, I am so glad to welcome our special musical guest, George Mann. George is a former union organizer and activist based in Ithaca, New York. He sings songs from the last century of the labor and social justice movements, as well as newer and original songs. We'll hear some of those today. He toured extensively with Julius Margolin until his death and has collaborated with such folk legends as Tom Paxton, Utah Phillips, and Billy Bragg. And his work with veterans, unions, and anti-war groups has kept him on the front lines for more than 25 years. You can find more information about George and his music at georgemanmusic.com. Take it away, George. Thank you. Good morning. If I had a hammer, a hammer in the morning, a hammer in the evening, over this land, a hammer out of danger, a hammer out of warning, a hammer out the love between my brothers and my sisters, oh, oh, over this land. If I had a bell, I'd ring it in the morning, ring it in the evening, over this land, I'd ring out danger, I'd ring out a warning, ring out the love between my brothers and my sisters, oh, oh, over this land. And if I had a song, Sing it in the morning, sing it in the evening, over this land. I'd sing out danger, sing out a warning, sing out the love between my brothers and my sisters, oh, oh, over this land. Now I've got a hammer, and I've got a bell, and I've got a song to sing. Over this land, it's the hammer of justice, the bell of freedom. It's a song about love between brothers and my sisters. Uh -huh. Over this land, it's the hammer of justice, the bell of freedom. It's a song about love between brothers and my sisters. Uh -huh. Over this land. we're going to have fun today. I, our call to worship this morning is by Arlen Goff. Music arises from depths unknown, often without words, but never without meaning. And spirit rises from deep within me, seducing my body to join the song. First a terror in the soul, then tapping of toes. Breath aligns with breath, heart beats in syncopation, and a stuttering buzz in my throat becomes a hum. Breath with breath, beat with beat, and music and spirit arise together. Wed with faith and hope and love and power, a song is born, bursting from my lips in sweet, sonorous symphony. A melody joining with other souls, Perhaps in tune, perhaps not, 
but a song still arising from deep within and from community. Spirit moves, soul births song, and hope fills life, and I am not alone. How can I keep from singing? I invite you to join me in the words to say the chalice. We light this flame to invite a world of peace where we heal the wounds, where we share what we have with one another, where justice is another word for relationship, and we listen for what love has to say. Well, good morning, everybody. My name is George Mann, and I come from Ithaca, New York, and I'm very happy to be with you today. They asked me to do a little bit of speaking and talking about the work of a folk musician and how it ties into struggles for justice and specifically my work, which involves work with veterans and nursing in veterans' homes primarily when I'm not touring. I'm only on the road maybe two to three months of the year, which might seem a lot for some people, but a month of that is in Australia each year. I go every October and do about a four-week tour in Australia, which I'll be doing in October again this year. But how I came to this work was through the labor movement. And uh, I, I'm keenly aware that we're here in the state of the Lawrence Spread and Roses strike. And uh, one of my favorite songs that I always used to sing with the New York Labor Chorus when I was in New York City. But the work of a folk singer is interesting because I did work in the real world. I was a journalist, I was an editor, I was a legal proofreader for one point, but I also was a union organizer for about nine years. And I got my start in the uh, Graduate Student Employees Union in SUNY, the State University of New York. We fought for eight years to get a union for the 3,000 teaching assistants. And I know you have a union here for your teaching assistants in Amherst. And that, when I was 29 years old and I was finishing up my master's degree in English, thinking, what am I going to do with my life? All of a sudden, we finally won the court battle after eight years to get a right to unionize the 3,000 teaching assistants. And I was hired. Uh, for the election in 1992. And that changed my life in so many ways. It opened my, my world. I had been a musician, a rock musician in my 20s and teens, played all the rock and roll, heavy metal, that kind of stuff. But the labor music, the social justice music comes from the civil rights struggle, from the labor struggles of the 30s and 40s, and of course the civil rights struggles. Wasn't really in the top of my head as a, a young white kid on Long Island growing up, you know? I mean, we only had three black kids in our high school. I'll never forget that, you know. We were so underexposed to the world. And when I joined the labor movement and got involved with that is when people started telling me, well, you know, there's a lot of great music out there, and you should check some of this out. And I started hearing the labor ju and social justice songs of Pete Seeger. Now, that first song we sang, you might remember that, of course, Peter, Paul, and Mary sang it, If I Had a Hammer. But it was written by Pete Seeger and Lee Hayes in 1948. And the, talk about evolution. The original version of that sang, I'd, ha when I'd hammer out the love between all of my brothers. And the Weavers sang that. It wasn't a big hit for the Weavers, Pete's group. But when Peter, Paul, and Mary decided to do the song, they got in touch with Pete. And they said, you know, we, we really don't like that line. What about the women? You know, we want to change that. To, I'd hammer out the love between my brothers and my sisters. And, you know, songwriters typically get pretty, well, they're pretty antsy if somebody tries to change their words. But this was Pete Seeger, and you know what he said? I wish I'd thought of that. <laughs> so that was an early opening. I've been lucky enough to sing on stages with Pete Seeger, Utah Phillips, and uh, know a lot of these people. We've just released an album that's coming out in two weeks, actually, called Labor Day, which I did bring copies of the CDs that I've produced over here. Cy Khan, if that name rings a bell to anybody, dear friend, he turned 80 years old this year in April, and he asked me to produce an album of his labor songs, which we've just released, or not even released yet, it's literally coming out August 26, but I've got copies of it. It's called Labor Day. And what we did was we, um, we took nine of Cy's old songs that have never been recorded, and we recorded them from scratch. We used Cy's voice for some of them. I recorded five songs with my group in all in Ithaca, 
But then we added 10 other artists to it. John McCutcheon, Peggy Seeger, Billy Bragg, Tom Chapin, Kathy Matea, Magpie, all these great artists. Joe Jenks, you may have heard of, a good singer, great singer. And um, we released that album, and it's here in case we'll talk about it later. But what I want to talk about is how I came to social justice. And through the labor movement, I started hearing the songs of Pete Seeger from the 30s and the 40s, the songs of Woody Guthrie from the 30s and the 40s that didn't make it to the top of the hit charts. We all know this land is your land. We all know if I had a hammer. But Pete sings songs like, How Can I Keep From Singing, which you quoted. Um, and those songs really hit me emotionally on a level that I was not prepared for at 29, 30 years old when I first started hearing this stuff. And it opened a whole new world to me. And so I left the rock and roll world, so to speak, and started becoming a folk singer some 20 years ago. And that's an evolution, you know? Uh, and so I'd like to sing, before we move on, I'd like to sing this song from Cy Kahn. It's one of the songs I recorded for the new album called They All Sang Bread and Roses. Now, it's not the Bread and Roses song, which you all know, and the choir sings apparently, right? Uh, but it's a song about struggle and about people, and it's one of Cy's beautiful songs. And uh, it talks about not just, as any good song should, this song takes you back through history and lays out a groundwork for the future and what we hope will happen in the future. And it goes like this. <laughs> Now don't you think it's crazy This old world and its ways Whoever thought the 60s Would be called the good old days But folks like you and me Who thought that they were all alone Within this honored movement Found a home And we all sang bread and roses Joe Hill and union made we linked our arms and told each other we are not afraid solidarity forever would go rolling through the hall we shall overcome together one and all the more i study history more I seem to find that in every generation there were times just like that time when folks like you and me who thought that we were all alone within this honored movement found a home and they all sang bread and roses Joe Hill and Union May they linked their arms and told each other we are not afraid solidarity forever would go rolling through the hall we shall overcome together one and all just as every generation fears that it might be the last our presence here is witness to the power of the past. And just as we have drawn our faith from those who now are gone, younger hands will take our work and carry on. Join me. And they'll all sing bread and roses, Joe Hill and Union May. They'll link their arms and tell each other we are not afraid, solidarity forever. We'll go rolling through the hall. We shall overcome together, one and all. We shall overcome together, one and all. But that, that social justice, and I said, I was a union organizer for nine years, mostly with the Musicians Union in New York City, Local 802, but also with the Communication Workers of America. And I got to that point where both of those vocations were pulling at me, and one had to win out. I couldn't do both. And I finally made the break about 14, 15 years ago to become a full-time full musician. Now the difference here is this, you don't have a regular paycheck, so you're constantly scrounging for work, you're looking for work, you're taking jobs wherever you can, 
and I learned that there's nothing wrong with playing for free, but of course a lot of people expect that. A lot of organizations ask that and they don't realize that it's actually work. But it is work. I, I, I know 200 plus songs in my head, let alone the 80 or 90 songs that I've recorded that I've written. And I can sing them at will. And so being able to do that is a, a skill. Uh, people always say, how do you remember all those words? I have no idea. But I can pull songs out that I haven't sung for months and usually get them right, you know? So um, I want to share with you one more song in this section about social justice because, as I said, Woody Guthrie and Pete Seeger certainly stand as the beacons of light in, in labor folk music, for sure, and activism. Uh, before them, there was a guy named Joe Hill that you may have heard of, right? I dreamed I saw Joe Hill last night. He was with the Industrial Workers of the World, but he was executed in 1915 in Salt Lake City for a murder nobody believes he committed. He was framed up on a murder charge and he was the best known songwriter in the IWW. The only problem is they didn't really have recorded music back when he was alive, so there's no recordings of Joe Hill, there's only his words that he left us. But Woody Guthrie, of all the great artists, Woody Guthrie is probably, he's gotta stand up there, him and Pete, as the, 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 the greatest artists that reflected the American people and the struggles of American people. Not just during the Depression, but even later in life through the great through the World War II and, of course, through the civil rights struggle. So I, when I read the biography of Woody Guthrie some 20 years ago, uh, Joe Klein's biography is the best one, Woody Guthrie Alive, because he had interviewed people who were alive and knew Woody Guthrie. If you ever want to read a book about, there's many biographies about Woody, but I recommend Joe Klein's book, Woody Guthrie Alive. And when I read that book, it was such an eye-opener for me as a young organizer that I wrote this song called Oklahoma Son about Woody. And kind of tell, remember, Woody Guthrie only had about 15 years of active life. He was never a star. He wrote so many great songs. But Huntington's disease, which is similar to Parkinson's, robbed him. By 43 years old, he was in a hospital, and he died at 55, um, no longer able to sing in the last 10 years of his life. So this song, Oklahoma Son, Let's sing for Woody Guthrie today. In school they made us sing it Every morning like the sun And the words all ran together Till it ended up as one And the image is forever Captured by an Oklahoma sun that could be the biggest thing a man has ever done. Oh, Woody, you were past it by the time that I was born. And your Huntington's disease left you frail and mute and torn. Already bound for glory, a million thoughts, a thousand songs. Passed to legend by the day that I was born. You were Oklahoma's son, but in the end belonged to no one. Sign painter, singer, sailor, soldier, born. Both a father and a child, a fascist fighting union man. Songs and poems for everyone Though the Dust Bowl couldn't stop you Nor could the bulls in the railroad yards Found thousands of your people Under bridges and in boxcars There was opportunity in everything you saw to turn a witnessing into another song. You were Oklahoma's son, but in the end belonged to no one. Sign painter, singer, sailor, soldier, bond. Both a father and a child, a fascist fighting union man. Writing songs and poems for everyone Sure in later years you staggered drunk Disabled rambling on There's so much in your short life and work To 
cherish and pass on and though they don't sing all your words in polite company still I know this land was truly made for you and me so every time I sing that song to the old or to the young yeah I sing all the verses like I know you would have done and I bow my head to greatness make sure they know who you were and that's the greatest gift I got from Oklahoma's son that could be the greatest gift from Oklahoma's son and that could be the biggest thing a man has ever done reading comes from Manish Mishra Marzetti. For each child that's born, a morning star rises and sings to the universe who we are. Listen carefully. Can you still hear the song? The one sung for you when you were born. The song sung by a cosmos in motion, rejoicing at your life. You, the results. You, the outcome. You, the celebration. Listen carefully. Can you hear it still? A song of possibility. A reminder that we still have time to be who and what we need to be. Listen carefully. The vast expanse echoes a recognition that it's not always easy. Possibilities can be hard to pursue. Roads not taken, wrong turns, destinations that disappoint. Through this, the song persists. The universe sings no less because time and space wear us thin. The music calls us to recognize our limitations, to recognize that the song is best sung with others. Here in community, bringing alive that most primordial and original impulse the desire to sing to the universe who we are, to celebrate and share our lives with others. Well, the other part they wanted me to talk about today was my work with nursing homes and veterans. And as I mentioned earlier, I said when you're a folk singer, you realize that you need to look for work wherever it is uh, or wherever it makes sense to sing. You know, I, I wouldn't sing for the Republican Party, let's put it that way, okay? There, we do have limits, you know? We do have draws lines, but, uh, but um, a long time ago, I started singing for veterans in nursing homes, some 25 years ago when I was first leaving New York City, and we were thinking of leaving New York City at least, and uh, getting into this work full time. And that work, first off, well, if you're looking for something to do and you have some free time, go to a veteran's home, go to a nursing home, go talk to the people there. You realize some of these people are left and abandoned and they're just waiting to die. Um, not all of us have full families, loving spouses, loving children, right? Um, loneliness in the nursing and veterans homes is one of the biggest issues that they have to deal with. Um, I remember reading a, a survey that said there had been a study done, or an article that said there had been a study done, it said something like 70 to 75 percent of nursing home residents never get a visitor after the first month after they're living there. Um, and so I found wonderful stories among these people. And I produced an album in 2016 called Until You Come Home, Songs to Heal the Wounds of War. And again, that features people like Magpie and Joe Jenks and Utah Phillips and Ani DeFranco and others on it. And it's all songs about what the effect of war is, not just on those who serve, but also on their families and, and those around them. And this song is not on that record, it's not one of my other albums, but it's a song I wrote for a veteran named Jim. 
Now, when I met Jim in a, in a nursing home, in a veteran's home, about maybe eight or nine years ago, I didn't know who he was. He was in the dementia ward. You walk in and you sing, and there's 30 or so veterans there, and some of them are in wheelchairs, some of them are mobile, but they all have memory or mental issues dealing with the memory loss and, of course, Alzheimer's. So I was doing a Johnny Cash song or something like that, one of these rocking songs, you know. And he started rapping his hands on the table like, bang, 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 bang. I didn't know him. I was worried. I started like looking at the staff. Is, you know, is he okay? I said, is it okay? And finally one of the staff said to me, it's okay. He used to be a drummer. And that's when I knew that the music was making its connection to him. So for years, I would sing to Jim. Once a month, I played in that veteran's home. It's near Buffalo, New York. And slowly over those years, the drumming slowed down. The reaction stopped. He used to be able to talk when I first met him, but then the speech was gone. And eventually, it got to the point where Jim would just be rolled in in a wheelchair bed, eyes open, fixed glare, no response. You could talk to him, you could shout at him, you could sing to him, and he would just stare. And that was the best he could do. It wasn't him, it was the disease. But one day I was singing in there, and I just started singing, and there was, again, a room a little bigger than this, a little smaller than this, of course. But he was in the back there, and I hadn't even noticed him initially in his wheelchair bed. And then all of a sudden I'm singing a rock and roll song or whatever song I was singing, and I realized I saw something going on there. And in his wheelchair bed, one little finger was doing this. And it did it for the next song or two, and that was it. I couldn't get him to say anything. I couldn't get him to react. But it was the only time I saw him move in those last months that I, I sang to him. Then COVID happened, and I couldn't sing there for two years. And he passed during the COVID epidemic, you know? But I went home and I wrote this song called Nothing Left to Say. and recorded it for an album about six years ago. And uh, Jim, like I said, when he passed away, the, the nurses sent me an email saying, we just wanted you to know that he'd passed. And, and I made a video for this song, and uh, we sent that off to his family so that they would see the video. It's called Nothing Left to Say. Jim is sitting in the corner They've engaged the parking brake As I launch into another song His one finger starts to shake It's been months since he has spoken Mostly he just sits and stares Long ago he was a drummer now he doesn't leave this chair So I smile at him And I feel for Jim I can see him slipping away My greatest fear One day you'll find me here With nothing left to say Several years ago, I met him. The music jolted him awake. Wrap his hands upon the table. So hard I feared that they might break. But now the drummer's hands are quiet. Silenced by the hands of time. That one finger still remembers And it's sending me a sign So I smile at him And I feel for Jim I can see him slipping away My greatest fear One day you'll find me here With nothing left to say so I smile at him and I feel for Jim. I can see him slipping away. My greatest fear 
One day you'll find me here with nothing left to say. Now it's not, it's not all sadness, and, uh, but it is very sad because you see people who are at the end of their lives uh, dealing with diseases or illness or body breaking down in the various ways or their mind breaking down, and you try to bring a little bit of joy to them, you know, in those few minutes. And many of the homes I sing in, not many, a few of the homes, I sing for over 30 nursing and veterans homes on a regular basis in, in upstate New York, and, and I do concerts for them out on the West Coast. I was just out there a couple of weeks ago in Oregon and Washington singing out there. And uh, sometimes, so it's, it's very unpredictable. That's why I said if you're ever interested in some community service and you got a few hours, go spend some time in a nursing home, in a veterans home, and just talk to people, play cards with them ask them about their lives. You find out such amazing things. Um, in one home that I sing in regularly for the last two or three years I've been playing there, I knew a guy named Francis who was 106 when he passed away in December. I met him when he was about 103 probably, and uh, amazing guy. Things about Francis I can tell you, and I'll tell you quickly. He became a pilot at 90 years old and flew his last solo flight at, on his 99th birthday, okay? And then he went into a nursing home when he was about 101 or whatever, you know? But during World War II, he was a requisition officer for the Army, um, and he was stationed at Wright-Patterson in Ohio. He wasn't serving overseas. But his job was to assist the British Air Force any time that they needed supplies because the Germans were bombing their factories, right? So Francis, when I got to know him one day, he said, come to my room, I want to I wanna show you something. So I wheeled him in his wheelchair, he was about 104 maybe at that point, and uh, he says, I want to show you something. He says, you know, when I was doing this work for the British Air Force, there was a time where the, 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 the British factory for the Lancaster bomber had been attacked, and they needed rubber for the tires and for the, the hosing, the, the tubing. He said, I was able to get it to them in 48 hours. He was so proud of that. And then he said, I want to show you something. And he pulled out of his drawer the Order of the British Empire Award. Now the Beatles received the member of the British, an MBE, right? That's the highest civilian award a citizen can get in Britain is an MBE. But the OBE is the highest award a non-citizen can be given. And he showed me the letter dated 1945, signed by Queen Elizabeth to him. And it was just an amazing guy, you know? So, uh, and then there's other things, like I sing in um, senior centers that are like adult daycare centers, right? I do two or three of them pretty regularly. And you've got young people in their 20s and people in their 70s and 80s who just can't be left at home alone, right? Uh, maybe they're living with a child, an adult child who's working, or maybe their spouse can't take care of them, or maybe they're just a troubled, you know, mentally or physically incapacitated or di uh, disabled uh, young person. And there's this woman named Marion at this center. I see her every month now for five years, six years I've been playing there more. She never speaks. She's Down syndrome, you know, and she's got to be 70 or 80 years old. She sits there doing her cross pu crossword puzzles all day, barely ever looks up. But about a month ago, two months ago, I guess it was now, she went to the bathroom, and as she walked past, she stopped in front of me and said, you're no Elvis Presley. <laughs> the first word she ever spoke to me. <laughs> and I didn't know what to say, so I said, well, neither are you, ma'am. And then she went back to her seat, and what did we decide? Because, of course, we had to sing some Elvis Presley songs, so we serenaded two or three Elvis Presley songs and got her to smile, and she smiled and waved, you know? But it uh, broke the ice a little bit. But I want to sing you one more song and then get back to the service. In one of the veterans' homes I sang in for many years, I knew this woman named Patricia, and she was a World War II veteran. I'd been a nurse during World War II. Never would tell me her age. I didn't find out till her, until her obituary ran that she passed at 94 years of age, about, we're talking seven, eight years ago now. 
But we had a loving relationship, and in that home, I would go and stroll through the home so I could spend five or ten minutes with each resident and go on to the next home, you know, next hall, you know. And we'd flirt a lot. She couldn't get out of her bed. She was always in a wheelchair bed from the first I knew her. But she was mentally fine. She sang in the choir that we put together occasionally for concerts. And I'd joke with her, oh, Patricia, you know, why don't we elope? I'll wheel you out the back here and we'll run off together. And she'd say things like, oh, I'll think about it, George. I'll get back to you. Or uh, I'd say, oh, Patricia, if only you were 40 years younger. You know, just joking at, with her in a loving relationship. Well, one day I went there, and then she was in the hospital, and they said she was very ill. And she you know, wasn't well. And she came back a couple weeks later. And then a week later, she was back in, because I sang at this home every Friday. So I would see her pretty regularly. And I was pretty sure she would, they, the staff knew I had a close relationship to her and said, we don't think she's going to make it, you know. So I went home, and I wrote this terribly sad song about her called Beautiful Blonde Babies. In the purest sense of the word, trying to say, well, what if she had been 40 years younger or I'd been born 100 years ago? Maybe we would have had beautiful blonde babies together, you know? And I wrote this song thinking she'd never, I'd never see her again, but two weeks later, she was back. And uh, I ran right to her room that morning when they told me she was back. And I said, Patricia, I'm so glad to see you. And she said, yeah, it was a tough, tough time. I said, I thought you might be a goner. And she said, yeah, so did I. And then I said, I wrote you a song. And I, I want to sing it to you. And she was like, oh, I bet you tell all the ladies that. I said, no, 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 I did. So I sat down. And she was quite woozy from the drugs she was on and the, what she'd been through. And I started singing the song. Then I realized the second verse has lines about her dying in it. I didn't know what I was going to do at that point, but then I looked up and she had already fallen asleep. <laughs> so I switched over to You Are My Sunshine and walked out of the room, and she never remembered it, and neither did I, and I never told her about it. But I did make a video for this song, and you can find it on YouTube. It's beautifully recorded with cello and piano, and it's called Beautiful Blonde Babies. <laughs> I don't want to hear about the world tonight I just would like to be here by your side Turn the TV off and sit in silence The window giving up the day's last line I rearrange the flowers and the photographs Glad that you are happy in this space. I take your hand and recognize each wrinkle, just like every line I see upon your face. But babe, if you were 40 years younger, or I'd been born a hundred years ago. here thinking about things that make me sad and the beautiful blonde babies that we never had all around you butterflies are floating or maybe they are angels tending wings And I both know that it is coming We are powerless to alter anything But babe, if you are 40 years younger Or I'd been born a hundred years ago I wouldn't be here thinking about things that make me sad the beautiful blonde babies we never had. So I'll ask you one more time if you'll elope with me. You tell me you'll consider it again. I'm just the guy who sings to you each Friday And 
It will be that way until the end. But babe, if you are 40 years younger, or I'd been born a hundred years ago, I wouldn't be here thinking about things that make me sad. The beautiful blonde babies that we never had. Oh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Ooh. Ooh. Ah. Ah. Thank you. Spirit of life, we come together one people of many joys and sorrows, many hopes and fears. We come together back to ourselves and to one another to say, yes, this is how it is inside me today. These are my emotions and my aspirations. Yes. This is how the world is today. News of violence and suffering has stretched me beyond what I can hold alone. We find our prayer in one another, in the lights of each other's candles, in the names of loved ones spoken with care, in sharing hopes for the future so that we don't have to hold them alone. Spirit of life, we are so grateful that we have each other. As we mourn, as we rejoice, as we dream, as we build, as we sing a more beautiful tomorrow. As we sing, may we know that it can be so. Amen. Well, when we look back on our lives, we always think about things that we could have done differently or wish we could have done differently. And this song is called, If I Could Turn Back Time. It's not the Cher song that was a big hit in the 80s, but uh, I wrote this thinking about some of the things that happened in my life. If I could turn back time no, I'd do it in a minute I would try to make some fine Adjustments to the things I'd find there in it All the hate that I have seen I'd speak up where I stood quiet You can't let the bullies win can't give up the fight If I could turn back time Oh, wouldn't that be nice I'd get to see her leave me once and then later leave me twice But the trade-off would be That I'd know that love again All those days among the trees Dreaming of a future when Ah, we would be together Ah and these good times would never end If I could turn back time And revisit my mistakes I'd recognize my privilege Sometimes was behind my lucky breaks And I'd say I'm sorry for The things that I have done To 
some along the way All the friends I've left behind I wonder where they are today And I'm here under the trees Dreaming of a future when ah, We will be together these good times will never end Will you join me in saying our words to extinguish the chalice? We extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we are together again. If you don't take time to dance a little, to sing a little, to spend time with friends, to have a little drink once in a while with friends, where's the good in living, right? And it's a, it's a very joyful song. And the chorus goes, and all of life plays like a tune. It sounds so sweet, but ends too soon. You'd better rosin up your bow before it's time to go. If the fiddle strings felt no bow stroke, if the concertina bellows broke, if no one sang or cracked a joke, then where's the good in living? And all of life plays like a tune. It sounds so sweet. But ends too soon You'd better rosin up your bow Before it's time to go If no one threw their feet about If the Guinness boy stopped making stout You'd forget what life was all about And soon become quite thirsty And all of life plays like a tune It sounds so sweet But ends too soon You'd better rosin up your bow Before it's time to go When all you've got is hawked or pawned When all your money's spent and gone You'll find out what you've been living on And never even knew and all of life plays like a tune It sounds so sweet, but ends too soon You'd better rosin up your bow Before it's time to go And if the fiddle strings felt no bow stroke If the concertina bellows broke If no one sang or cracked a joke Then Where's the good in living? Have a lovely day, everybody. Thank you.